Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and welcome to the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where we do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I'm your host, Paige Vanderbeck, and together we're going to explore magic and spirituality, social justice, the psychic realm, and truly modern witchcraft. Hello, my witchy friends, and thank you for tuning back into the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast. I'm your host, Paige Vanderbeck, and while I don't want to make any promises, I am hoping that I'm back for good. This is episode 100 of the show, though if you listened to my previous episode, you'll know this is more like episode one, again. So let's have a little introductory awkwardness, just in case you've never listened before. My name's Paige. I live in southwestern Ontario, up in Canada, a small city called Windsor, and I have been a witch for almost 30 years now. I publish 30 books, sorry, (laughs) I have published four books on the subject of witchcraft, and the title of today's show, Emotional Wisdom Part 2, comes from the title of my favorite of the books, Witchcraft for Emotional Wisdom, which came out in September 2021. Saying I have a favorite of my books probably sounds kind of weird, but uh, like a lot of artists and creative types, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with my own work. Please just do not tell the books that I have a favorite. I'm covering their ears right now. (laughs) Uh, I also released a book called Green Witchcraft in 2020, which was a bestseller and introduced me to a lot of new witches. So if that's what led you here, thank you so much for reading and for tracking me down. As the title of today's show, as the title of the show suggests, I am also a fat person and a proud feminist. I'm a cisgendered woman and heterosexual, but you might have found this show through a list of queer-friendly podcasts, which makes me feel super proud, as that's something I I, I really do strive to bring to my work. I believe that everyone is magical, and that all of these identities that we live with and within inform our magic in, in really beautiful ways. I love learning about different cultures, practices, histories, and perspectives on all things, but especially magic and spirituality that exists outside of the dominant religious paradigm of any place or group. Here in North America, that is usually Christianity, but I am not specific to that. (laughs) So that's why in my back catalog of both episodes and in my writing, you will find episodes about everything from Wicca to astrology, voodoo and African traditional religions, the history of tarot, deities from all over the world, and interviews with lots of different writers and mystics who are more capable of explaining and exploring those diverse topics than I am on my own. I believe that cultural appropriation is a really important topic in magic and spirituality and in all things, really. And that enforcing boundaries in that regard helps to protect ways of life and worship that would be lost or completely corrupted without them. But this is also not a show that is just for cisgender white folks to enjoy or to learn from. Um, It's for everybody. I want everybody to not only feel welcome here on the show and, and within all of my work, but I also want it to be helpful to anyone who happens to pick it up. If it isn't already obvious, I lean super far to the left, politically speaking. Here in Canada, we have this fun little, you know, it's an online thing. It's vote compass. It tells you which political party you're most aligned with. And sometimes I'm so far to the left, it's like, you're a communist. And I was like, whoo, well, that's probably true. Um, (laughs) So the one point of view that I, I never, ever entertain here is one that is aligned with hate. I hate that. I believe in punching Nazis and taking down turfs and speaking over men and, and, and white people. And for white people, especially knowing when to shut the fuck up. I also believe in curse words. So fuck you if you don't like it, I guess. (laughs) This isn't Facebook. I can swear here. Another topic that has long been a part of my work as a witch and will be even more so going forward is mental illness and disability. I am mentally ill. My mental illness is disabling. Since 2017, I've been going through treatment and therapy, trying a million drugs, um, and striving for proper diagnoses. I've been depressed and anxious, I mean, as long as I can remember. 
I have childhood trauma, and I have some from adulthood, as most of us do. I was diagnosed with ADHD at the ripe old age of 34 years old. Uh, And this year it's become clear that I actually have a personality disorder. Not super fun. Not a term that I super love, I'm not going to lie. One that's not studied much. It's not well understood. And it is, of course, pretty incurable. I've had it forever. I will have it forever. And it is a very big part of who I am. It's me. It's my it's my personality. And it is disordered. As you can hear, I'm I'm still kind of getting used to it. I'm trying to say it so it sounds less horrible over time. Um I hate it, you know, but I owe it to myself to stop hating it, to find a way to live with it, and to build a life where I can be happy and fulfilled and feel like a productive part of the world in my own way. I'm a Capricorn, so feeling productive is very important to me, but I am also very anti-capitalism, so do not get scared by the word productive. (laughs) Now, I don't just bring all of this up for introductory purposes, though. Uh, I bring this up because it's a big part of why the Fat Feminist Witch exists in the first place. I began this podcast in November 2015 after leaving a job at a witchy type store and realizing that although the shop wasn't for me, the subject matter was. I did not want to stop learning about and teaching others about witchcraft and magic. I also needed to create a job for myself because I had been struggling for far too long to be financially independent and feel like I could work in a way that put something good out into the world. My mental illness is a bit chaotic, and I go through seemingly random, depressive episodes. They can last for days, weeks, or even, you know, months at a time. I I never really know when they're coming, and I never really know when they're going to end, and sometimes I can't even tell you why they started or ended. So it's, um, it's disruptive, you know, they keep me from being able to concentrate or focus. They, they interrupt my, my memory processes, uh, my sleep. It can cause physical pain and extreme fatigue. It's, it's difficult to be a reliable person at work when that happens all the time. Um, outside of the podcast and, and writing, I've never held a job for longer than about like 16 months. And by the end, I'd always let the people that I worked with down. And even, I mean, I've, it, it's not like I made someone leave their job, but how difficult it became to work in the places where I was working and, and how chaotic the, the work environment was. It actually encouraged like full grown adults with children to leave their full time jobs. And that's something that made me feel really guilty and that I, I really don't like. So in addition to having those issues, I often would leave a job when I felt like that was going to happen. So I've had a million of them. So I needed, I needed to make my own job. Um, I needed to make my own space. I needed to do something where I could feel productive. I could feel like I'm helping people and I could make the money that I need to live. Of course. I also needed a job that was very creative. (laughs) I'm a very creative person and That is my superpower. It's also something that keeps me focused. So I needed a job that uh, changed a little bit, but, you know, wasn't something I had to relearn every month. But that changed frequently, that kept me interested, that I was passionate about, and that was very creative. Uh, And also where I called the shots. You know, I could decide if it was a work day or not. I could decide how much money I needed to make. And that need, none of that... Those needs have gone away, um, even though I'm not in an environment that is as conducive to doing this work. That's part of the reason I walked away back in January of this year. But I read something in a novel a little while ago that kind of shook me out of this. It was really just one line, but it really, it has been stuck in my head ever since. So the book was Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And yes, there was a, a TV show based on the book on Amazon Prime, I was watching the show and reading the book at the same time. And the titular character, Daisy Jones, says, uh, I'm not an art, I'm an artist. So either you let me record the album the way I want, or I'm not showing up ever. And someone who had no time for her shit, but genuinely cared about her, was super honest and replied, Daisy, someone who insists on the perfect conditions to make art isn't an artist. 
they're an asshole. <laughs> really got stuck in my head. <laughs> uh, I needed time off. I truly did. But I also think I was a bit of an asshole, even if it was just to myself. My home and my environment are very important to me. They always have been. Um, because I grew up in one that was very chaotic and even abusive. When I began this show, I had a stable environment, a home, a one that was mine, where I lived alone, I was comfortable, and had space to stretch out and to explore things and find inspiration all the time. I'm now living in a very cramped environment where I'm never alone, that is chaotic and abusive, and because of my trauma, I'm just going to say it, I freaked the fuck out. I desperately need to get out of here, and to do that, I need money. Uh, but more importantly, I need to survive living here, emotionally. And a month ago, I almost didn't. Before I continue here, I just have to add a little trigger warning. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about suicide and about severe depression. So, if that is something that is difficult for you, that is what's going to come up in a minute, not even in a minute, in a few seconds. So just a heads up, if you need to walk away, if you need to turn this off, I totally understand. So about a month ago, I tried to kill myself. I took a few months worth of my medication for ADHD, which is speed, and I tried to die. Luckily, my body and my subconscious mind banded together to foil my plans. <laughs> Uh, I have to laugh about it, because otherwise I'll start crying. Um, I was violently ill, and though I had still overdosed, uh, I survived. It was the middle of the night. No one else was awake. I cleaned myself up. I got in bed. I was freaking out, you know. <laughs> what am I going to do now? This was my only plan. Now I actually have to go on living as soon as morning gets here. And I wasn't very happy about it. Um, I felt panicked, panicked. Then the sun came up and it hit this incredible Japanese honeysuckle bush that grows kind of right outside my window. It's, it's across a little yard, but it's right out there. And the bush was full of these happy little birds and squirrels just doing bird and squirrel things. I love honeysuckle. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful bush. It's a beautiful flower. And, uh, you know, it's part of the reason I, I like this particular room and why I have my bed so near a window. I noticed the bush in that moment had buds on it and that it would bloom in just a few weeks. You know, the flowers weren't open yet. And I thought to myself, wow, I would have been really sad if I had missed that. And I realized that uh, it turns out I didn't actually want to die. So I'm pretty grateful that I didn't. <laughs> um, I went to the hospital, of course. I was, like I said, I had still overdosed. I could feel that I was on drugs. Um, I was locked in the psych ward against my will. Not something I recommend. Don't love it. Um... But while I was there, I remembered who I am and what I want and what I'm capable of. I remembered what it is that I believe in. I remembered also why being locked up in a room with windows that are screwed shut, <laughs> no view of trees or nature, no fresh air, why that was so hard, why that was so devastating to me. That is just... um something that, that makes me feel very afraid. I remembered that I've never wanted to be free from my life, but that I wanted to be free within it. Uh, when I get right down to it, I, I like me. <laughs> and I don't, I don't deserve to lose myself. I don't deserve to die. I deserve to live. And I deserve to live a life that is magical and mysterious and artistic, if that's what I want, and weird and funny, and, and um, I mean, whatever else I want it to be. And I deserve that, no matter how, you know, quote unquote, crazy I am. So I did what I do best. I talked my fat ass right out of that hospital. <laughs> 
I got them to let me go. Um, and I made it clear that I was willing to fight for myself, which is true. And I came back to this, this kind of awful place that I'm living. And I said, I'm not taking any more shit, so be warned. I got myself a bus pass so I could leave the house whenever I needed. I got back on medication. I, I joined different programs to help me cope. I applied for social housing. And I promised myself that I would do my very best not to hurt myself again. That's not who I am. I'm not someone who hurts me. You know, other people in my life have hurt me. Other people are still hurting me. But I don't do that. I don't hurt me and I'm not going to again. Now, spiritually speaking, I wouldn't say that I'm 100%. I had a major crisis of faith late last year. And my ability to believe in really anything was shaken. Um... I'm still struggling to curb my anger at the universe for, you know, seemingly guide me, guiding me to this, this place that I'm living. Um, and I'm really because I realized the universe didn't do that. When I look back, I see that I actually ignored my intuition time and time again, because I didn't trust myself. And that's how I ended up here. So I won't do that again either. I used to be a big time spellcaster and I haven't really gotten back to that yet, but I, I think about it all, all a lot, all the time. I think about magic. I dream about, you know, candles and herbs and crystals. I move my bed even closer to that window and closer to the honeysuckle bush. And I look at it every single day to remind myself that life is beautiful. It's actually in bloom now and I'm so lucky to see it. I, I feel so lucky every day. Um, for most of my life, I've been a fairly secular practitioner, but a few years back, I found myself a, a patron goddess that until this experience, I believed had either abandoned me or, you know, maybe even never been there in the first place. Voluptas, the, the Roman goddess of pleasure, whose sacred flower is honeysuckle. Voluptas is never going to be some voice that comes from outside of myself to guide me. She speaks to me through me, in my voice, through my body, in my emotions, and my desires. And as I was sitting there in the hospital, she reminded me of, of my greatest desire, which is just, just to live, and to be myself, and to be happy. Even if I'm not casting spells or reading my tarot cards every day, I'm still connected to magic and to witchcraft, and to to my goddess who is looking out for me by reminding me how to look out for myself. In the early days of the podcast, I used to do a segment that I called Sketchy Herbs and Magic Rocks, which was kind of an inside joke <laughs> I'm from my time at that witch store. I love the idea of the segment in itself, and I'm going to bring it back, but with a different name, as I want to keep that store in my past. So instead, I'm taking the easy route, and I'm calling this segment Green Witchcraft after my first book. And in it, I will share natural, magical items that you can use in your spellcraft or just everyday life, what they mean, and, and their overall magical energy. It won't always be a crystal and a plant specifically, but today it is. Either way, the, the items that I share will be able to work in tandem. They will have a, a matching or a, a similar energy that, again, you know, fit the overall tone of each episode. So today I'm going to talk about honeysuckle and also a crystal called yellow jade, which sometimes is also called lemon or honey jade. Let's start with honeysuckle. There are a lot of varieties of honeysuckle, all in the genus Lonicera. And magically speaking, the properties are, are pretty interchangeable. The European honeysuckle is the one that I think most people picture when they call to mind the flower. The flowers are a combination of white and yellow and pink once they're open. It's, it's really pretty. These flowers have a long skinny bud that's pink on the outside and then the flower that blooms starts out white and becomes yellow as the season goes on. So somewhere in the middle, you get all three colors competing for your attention. <laughs> 
The North American versions I see rarely have that, that pink color, but the white and the yellow flowers are still incredibly beautiful and fragrant. The most common in gardens where I live is Japanese honeysuckle. But I also see the wild North American varieties like grape or, or limber that have these flat round leaves that almost remind me of a lily pad. So pretty. And they attract a lot of birds and lots of animals. You know, birds love to hang out in them. They love to nest in them. Um, I think they're smelling the flowers, but I don't know enough about birds to say that for sure. <laughs> The fragrance of every variety gets stronger at nighttime. So the plant is often pollinated by nighttime insects like moths, along with honeybees and even hummingbirds, which love honeysuckle flowers. When I was researching magical flowers for green witchcraft, you know, way, way back in 2019, um, I kept seeing the flowers described as voluptuous. Such a great word, right? It's a word that a lot of people use to describe curvy or even fat bodies, you know, when they're trying to be nice about it or just not say the word fat. Um, <laughs> or if they genuinely mean it, right? But what a lot of people don't realize is that that's not actually what that word means specifically. Voluptuous describes something that inspires, relates to, or that even, you know, arises from pleasure usually sensual pleasure specifically. It can also describe someone who indulges in or is devoted to sensual pleasure. Though in that regard, you could also use the word voluptuary, which is real fun, or hedonist. Voluptuous is, a, is derived from the Latin word voluptus, meaning pleasure, which was of course the name of the goddess of pleasure. In Greek, that same goddess's name was hedon, which is where we get hedonism and hedonist. Sensuality is another word that a lot of people misunderstand. Sensual and sexual are often used interchangeably, but sensual means that it activates and is pleasurable for all of the senses. So sight, smell, touch, taste, and sound. This can definitely describe sex, and, and sex is one of those things that can easily hit all five of those, right? Um, but a piece of music can be a sensual experience. Likewise, it can be a voluptuous one. Honeysuckle is voluptuous because its flowers are beautiful and fascinating, and its scent is very intoxicating. It's said that the scent on the night air can carry dreams of love and lust in through your windows. I know the one near my bedroom window smells so incredible at night. <laughs> the first the first night it was really it was really coming in with the breeze. I woke up with my face practically pushed against the screen of the window because I had been, you know, smelling it all night long and I was just trying to get closer and closer. So because of that description, when I began working with the goddess Voluptus and trying to divine what her sacred plants and colors and, and all of those things might be, um, because she doesn't have those, she's not, a, she's not a goddess that has lots of mythology, um, and because of that, she's not a goddess that has a, a big following among witches. She's She's, <laughs> she's super cool as soon as I describe her and her parents who are, are Cupid or Eros and Psyche are very popular, but she is one that, that kind of stayed in the background. So she didn't have a lot of uh, magical associations with things. And that's something I had to discover. And I actually did a, an episode about that before. If you want to go back and listen, I can link to it in the description. I've also talked about it on my blog. Um, but th the first flower that sprang to mind um, was the honeysuckle. And it has remained the most powerful tool that I have in connecting with her and her energy, especially with the experience I had about a month ago. So... Her energy and, and the energy of honeysuckle. This is a combination earth and water element type energy. So this plant is, is associated with both. It's aligned with the planet Venus, uh, the sacral chakra, which is a very sensual and also sexual chakra, and the zodiac sign of Sagittarius, which seems odd because Sagittarius is a, is a fire sign. Um, but honeysuckle in magic is very lucky. It's very sexy. It's very attractive. And these are all Sagittarius qualities. It's also got a cheeky, almost mischievous quality to it that is very in line with those vibes as well. Just a heads up, I love you Sagittarius. 
It's one of my favorite zodiac signs. A lot of my favorite people are Sagittarius. And not just in, like, you know, my personal life, but also, like, musicians and stuff. It's it's kind of fun. Um, so honeysuckle can be used for luck and love magic in just about any way. For attraction and, and getting noticed, so even getting a new job or something like that. And for increasing psychic intuition. Especially if you tend to get those impressions in your body through the senses. Also, psychic dreams, of course. <laughs> Aside from simply standing next to the flowers and breathing it in, which is, which is number one. I also walk through my neighborhood and... and collect photographs of other people's honeysuckle uh, bushes and vines in their gardens. Um, my favorite way to use the flower is by infusing it in oil. So you can pick the flowers at dawn or dusk when the smell is the most potent and dry them on paper towels for a few days. I recommend doing that in your bedroom. I have a whole tray of them <laughs> drying in my bedroom right now and my room smells absolutely incredible. So I highly recommend that. Uh, and then you fill a mason jar at least halfway with those dried flowers. You have to dry them out for a few days. Depending on how humid your climate is, you'll have to just check them and, and see when they're ready to go. I live in a very humid place, so it takes kind of a long time. Fill the mason jar at least halfway with your dried flowers. And then all the way up with an oil like olive or sweet almond, which happens to be my favorite. If you have acne or are prone to breakouts and you want to put this on your body, you can also use jojoba oil, J-O-J-O-B-A. This does not trigger pimples. It's called non-comatogenic. So leave the oil to infuse for at least four weeks in a, a dark place like the, the closet or, or under the bed. You don't really want to put it in the window. After that time, open it up and smell it. If it suits you, strain out the flowers and add some vitamin E oil as a preservative. If you have a just a little bottle of it, you don't need to add much. I add about the equivalent of what you would get in one of those little vitamin E gel caps that you take as a vitamin. So I think that's about an eighth of a teaspoon. It's not much. So with that, the oil should be good until the following year when you can make some more if it lasts that long. <laughs> uh, you can use it as a body oil or as a perfume. A, a little roller ball bottle is great for that. Or you can use it as a massage oil, either by yourself or with someone else. It can be used to clear or activate the sacral chakra. And to do that, you can rub some right on that area, which uh, if you have a womb is that general area or it's it's kind of right below your your navel, your belly button. And while you do that, you can imagine this this kind of orange light growing and, and emanating from that area. I've also seen recipes online that blend it with bees beeswax to make a lip balm, which I gotta say would be excellent for going on a date or doing some making out on a warm summer night. That sounds really nice. Or just for a salve that you can put on your body that's nice and moisturizing. Uh, if you want to blend it with other flowers, rose and jasmine are great companions for the aroma. And they have a lot of overlapping magical properties. So rose and jasmine are also very sensual. Uh, they can be very sexual. They're very much about connecting with your body as well as beauty. Rose is also said to have one of the most positive vibrations of anything on the planet. So that, that's a really good flower to add in there. If you need some, if you need some really good vibes, that's a good one to combine it with. Jasmine is another night blooming plant. So if you are trying to work with the moon or some nighttime magic or really tap into that, that middle of the night witching hour type vibe, Jasmine is a good one to combine there. Uh, if you're not into oil, you can also use the dried flowers. You can make them into tea. They make a really nice iced tea. You can combine them with uh, lemon juice to make a lemonade. You can add them to a bath. Or you can just, you know, put them in a in a vase next to the bed or hang the sprig there and let it lull you to sleep. If you are looking to get yourself a job or get noticed in some kind of way. You can use the dried flowers to 
make an altar display almost. If you're trying to get a job, take your resume, put it on your altar, and sprinkle the honeysuckle flowers on top as you say a little prayer to get that job for yourself. If you can, include a, a business card from the place where you're applying. If you want to get noticed by someone specifically and you're trying to get through to them over the phone or on an app online, you can put your phone right on your altar and kind of surround it with your honeysuckle flowers. And that will, you know, encourage them to think of you more, to notice you a little bit more and to reach out. And of course, any spells for love or lust or luck or anything like that can be amplified by the use of the honeysuckle flowers, either in their dry form or as an oil. Wear your oil to your job interview. If it's a scent-free environment, put it underneath your clothes so it, it doesn't bother anybody, but it, it shouldn't as it's a natural smell. Yellow jade is also called lemon or honey jade, depending on the tone of its color. The one I have is clearly a lemon because the yellow has a cooler tone and you can see that it's a teensy bit green. If it's got a warmer tone and an orangey tint to it that makes it the color of honey, well, that's the cute name to go with. Doesn't really matter, honestly. <laughs> but I am a bit of a nerd for colors and it's something I, I can't help but notice. Either way, it, it is all the same stone. Um, but yellow jade is a new stone to me. It was gifted to me by my nephew a few months ago. Like regular green jade, which grows in abundance here in Canada, uh, it's a very lucky stone. It attracts good fortune. I put it in a drawer when he gave it to me, and I, I just kind of forgot about it, honestly. Um, and then when I, I came home from the hospital, I opened up that drawer, and I saw it sitting there. Uh, so, of course, I, I had to pick it up and, and look it up, because, uh, as is so often the case, it turns out that that crystal had exactly the energy that I needed. Lemon jade is a stone of optimism and emotional wisdom. In the Complete Crystal Handbook by Cassandra Eason, which is my favorite, um, my my favorite crystal encyclopedia, uh, it even says where to amplify your internal radar to know a good decision from a bad one. An excellent shield if you are easily hurt by someone with an over abrasive attitude. I definitely have felt connected, disconnected from my own internal radar for some time, and part of the reason I'm struggling in my living situation is that there are two people with very over abrasive attitudes that are causing me pain, sometimes unintentionally, but um, I'm unfortunately also the target of some intentional harassment. Uh, and the entry here in the encyclopedia, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I have to stop for a second. M my cat, Alley Cat, is right here. She is purring like crazy and she is shaking her head a lot and she's wearing a, a little bell on her collars. <laughs> So just a heads up if you hear her. I don't edit out cat sounds because I feel like you are the type of people that would appreciate cat sounds. So just a heads up. Uh, so the entry in the, the Crystal Handbook also states that it can help people resist bullying and harassment by increasing their self-confidence and giving them the emotional strength to recover from painful social interactions. It's good if, if social anxiety is an issue for you. It's a strong stone for the solar plexus chakra, which is right in the middle of your belly, uh, and is the seat of our self-confidence and our overall sense of self. Emotionally, uh, lemon jade can also help break someone out of a rut or a long bout with despair and to reconnect with their soul's purpose. This is a stone that can help me find my way back to myself and encourage me to feel positive and, and hopeful while I do that. Crystals are so, they're so spooky for this. Like this is just such a, a regular thing with crystals for me. Uh, they tend to find their way to me in moments when I, I need them the most. Um, after I read all this about the lemon jade, I, I couldn't help but smile. And I recalled when my nephew was really little and we used to go to the crystal shop near his house in Alberta when I would go visit. And we'd each pick out, you know, just a random stone, whatever, whatever we liked the look of and see what it was meant for after the fact. And of course it was always perfect for whatever whatever we were going through, whatever was happening at the time. And that was just, that was so enchanting. That's so, that's so cute. Um, so the fact that he'd just randomly come across it and decided to give it to me just because, um, it really re reiterated that, that revelation that I had in the hospital that 
I wasn't actually disconnected from, from my own magical self. So I've been carrying it around ever since, and it is currently sitting in my bra. <laughs> I certainly have felt more optimistic, and the fact that I felt the urge to make a new episode is, is probably not a coincidence. Interestingly, it shares a little something uh, neat with honeysuckle in that it can also be a dream crystal. It can help facilitate lucid dreaming and encourage your mind to work through some of the issues that may be keeping you stuck while you're sleeping. And some dreams definitely do feel like it's my brain trying to make sense of something or trying to work through a problem. So I've kept it next to my bed for the last few weeks, and I'm, I'm not sure about the dream specifically, as I don't really remember very many of mine, but I have been sleeping better than, than I have in a very long time. I've had a lot of trouble sleeping the last year at least, and, and lately it's been a lot easier to get really good restful sleep. I wake up feeling uh, refreshed and, and hopeful, and when I go to bed worried about something, I seem to wake up with a fresh perspective on it, or at least I, I feel a little less troubled about it. Uh, in my crystal handbook, it says that lemon jade is not only associated with the solar plexus, but the root chakra, which is the location of your survival instinct, and also what can make you feel stable. So that is also another uh, very important thing that I need specifically right now, but that everyone can benefit from tapping into. It's aligned with the zodiac signs Taurus and Gemini, and its planet is certainly the sun. So this is a stone that is recommended for wearing or keeping against your skin. You know, it works best when you make regular contact with it, which is why I've been carrying it in my bra. <laughs> Uh, and this is actually kind of common with crystals that are aligned with earthy signs like Taurus, which is also, not so coincidentally, the sign most associated with the goddess Voluptus. She really has been working extra hard to get my attention. <laughs> so honeysuckle oil and fragrance will combine very well with the lemon jade, but so will lemongrass, chamomile, sage, and sagebrush. Any sort of lemons, <laughs> lemon scent would, would be fine as well. So if you want to meditate with a stone, try lighting some of these scents as an incense or in a, in a uh, oil diffuser to help you connect with the energy. On the night that I tried to end my life, it was a pretty quick decision for me. Anyway, I, I'm an overthinker. I like to think about things for a very long time. Um, but this time I didn't. It was maybe two to three hours before deciding, between deciding I would do it and, and actually, actually doing it, actually swallowing pills. Um, in that time, I wrote a note, which hopefully will never be seen by anybody, uh, even though I can't bring myself to destroy it or read it. <laughs> I put on a dress that I love uh, and that made me feel really comfortable. I lit a black Venus of Willendorf candle that I have been saving for a very special occasion um, as a means of, of asking for protection um, and crossing over, I guess. And I took out copies of my two books that I mentioned earlier, Green Witchcraft and, and Emotional Wisdom. I had packed them away months ago. I packed all my books away. I, I couldn't... Um, I couldn't stand to look at them, you know? They made me feel like a fraud and also reinforced this really misguided belief that I had that I had lost everything. You know, I felt I had lost my, my independence, my control, my creative outlet, my career, my future, myself. I had lost myself is what I really felt. And what else is there, really? I mean, if you lose yourself, you've kind of lost everything, right? Um, and if I had lost everything, then I had no reason to stick around. So I put the books on the table with my candle, uh, and the note that I'd written, I turned on music, prepared to say goodbye to the world, I guess. About 25 minutes later, my body had other plans, <laughs> and I was so sick. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of details, because they're gross, but I will say that speed or amphetamine even the prescription stuff, this stuff can really, really hurt you physically. Um, the physical pain and the involuntary movements that I experienced for a full hour were really, really unpleasant, really wild. Uh, so please don't do this to yourself. It's not fun. Um, my muscles didn't relax again for like a full 24 hours later. It, it was really um, uncomfortable. Uh, anyways, 
I ended up in the hospital and they told me that I was going to have to stay for an indefinite amount of time. And I was being placed on an involuntary hold. It's still so hard to say out loud because if there's one thing in this world that I consider a phobia for me, um, it's being trapped or, or locked in. So this was really, this was a real scary moment. Um, but the, the positive side of that is that I suddenly panicked because I, I, I had so much to do. I couldn't just be taken out of my life, you know, who was going to feed and care for my cats. I had just started a bunch of seeds for the garden and I, I had house plants. No one else would take care of them. No one was going to water them. They would all die. My bedroom was locked, but I knew the people in my house would get in there, get it open, and I would lose some of my stuff. I didn't want to lose all my stuff, my books, my clothes, my photo albums. I didn't want to lose anything. I mean, I had library books checked out and, and some more on hold. I just can't not return library books, right? Plus, it was the middle of May. It was beautiful outside. It's the nicest time of year. You want me to miss out on some of the best weather we get all year for an indefinite amount of time? I couldn't do that. I thought of my bike. I had just tuned it up. I was, you know, it was waiting for me to go for a ride. I... I thought of the podcast episodes I'd put on my, you know, to listen list. Thought of music I wanted to hear, books I wanted to read, the honeysuckle vines outside of my window, and the flowers that I may miss if I didn't get out of there. I realized how much I had. And anyone who has spent time locked in a psych ward that has literal padded rooms and features a 24 7 low level ambient wailing, um, the kind that just reaches down into your gut and, and turns it to ice. It feels like death. That place feels like death. That was more of a near-death experience than the experience of, of literally overdosing and nearly dying. Luckily, the, the psychiatrist there eventually agreed with me that this was not going to be a therapeutic environment for me specifically. Uh, I had not been doing well. I refused to eat or to shower. And I just kept saying I was going to wait until I got out. I made some crack about not eating food in the underworld. So delirious that first day. Uh, because that's how you get stuck there, right? And I'm super glad that the nurse there didn't take offense. And um, even joked later when I got released that uh, I must have been right about the food, right? <laughs> and said, don't look back, which is also just so nerdy. Um, there's just nerds everywhere you go. And uh, I just want to say that she really is doing such an important job because she really treated me like a person. That place is super dehumanizing, so she makes a difference. When I got out, the first thing I did was take a shower. It was the best shower I'd ever taken in my entire life. Um, <laughs> but then I went and sat on my bed and I noticed the two books still still sitting on the table near my, my burnt out candle and everything. I picked up witchcraft for emotional wisdom and thought, oh my God, what a joke, right? But then I opened it up and I started reading it. And it was like, who, who even is this person? You know, in this book, I'm so sure of myself and, and my treatment and recovery were going so well. I was giving all of this incredible advice, you know, all the way through. I could feel this hope for the future. And I just had not felt like that in so long. I didn't even feel like the same person. Like like this this book was a mistake. You know, this this couldn't have been written by me. My name on the cover is a, is a mix-up. This isn't me. But when I wrote that book, I knew then that this was a really honest book. It was super hard to write. It was kind of triggering. I was going through rape crisis therapy while I was writing it and my undiagnosed ADHD had gotten so bad that I would be diagnosed with it one month after that book was released. I really I really poured myself in that book and I I, I shared a lot of very personal things. The person who wrote that book is is me, is the real me. That's the person that I felt like I had lost, or even that was never real to begin with, but, but there it was right in front of me. There's this person. It's all totally real. It's in black and white. And I'm not saying this like, oh my God, it's the best book ever. 
I mean, I think it's good, but <laughs> it's more that it's my book. You know, it's me. It's a part of me. And um, it wasn't something that I had lost. It was something that I had pushed away. I had put it into a box and ignored it. So I have since put all my books back on the shelf. <laughs> I look at my name on the spine. <laughs> and then, you know, I smell the honeysuckle outside the window and I feel a lemon jade poking me in the ribs underneath my bra wire. Um, and I think that maybe... <laughs> Maybe the world is actually pretty fucking magical, even if it's a mess. <laughs> I would have been really sad if I had missed out. So thanks for listening. <laughs> new here. <laughs> I'm Paige and I am the Fat Feminist Witch forever. And I promise that my next episode will be a lot less of a bummer. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast. If you want to learn more about me, hear past episodes of the show, read some helpful blog posts, and buy any of my books, you can do that from my website, thefatfeministwitch.ca. You can also find me on Instagram as Fat Feminist Witch, and Twitter as Fat Feminist Witch, and there's an I missing in that one. If you want to buy t-shirts, stickers, journals, and more with Fat Feminist Witch logos and artwork, you can do that at my T Public store, uh, which does go up to size 5X, and you will find the links to all of those in the description of the show. Until next time, my witchy friends, keep on ranting, raving, and wand-waving. <laughs>